Welcome to this presentation on key aspects of cybersecurity. I am Dr. Eric Cole and will be your presenter for the next 45 minutes. Whenever we talk about cybersecurity, I always like to start off with a simple question. What is cybersecurity? And as I know, it sounds like a trick question, but what I find is many people who have worked in the field for five, 10, or 15 years have trouble actually giving a clear definition of what actually cybersecurity is. So I always like starting off with that clear definition. Cybersecurity is understanding, managing, and mitigating the risk of your critical data being disclosed, altered, or denied access. Actually, when we look at cybersecurity, there's three key areas. So now I'll do the definition again with a little more emphasis. Cybersecurity is all about understanding, managing, and mitigating risk of your critical assets being disclosed, altered, or denied access. So when we're looking at cybersecurity, there's three key components. Risk. Risk is the probability for loss, and we need to recognize that when we're dealing with cybersecurity, there always has to be an acceptable level of risk that organizations are or are not going to tolerate. Next, it's all about critical data and critical information. Let's face it. What is the difference between a major breach or a minor breach? It all has to do with the amount of data that was compromised. If somebody breaks into a server and they steal five records, that's not a major problem. But if somebody breaks into a server and steals 500 million records, that becomes problematic, right? The disclosure of critical data is an unacceptable risk to the organization. But here's the key. What is the reason why a minor breach turns into a major breach? Why is it that it went from five records to 500 million? It's because the organization didn't have proper visibility and wasn't able to detect the attack in a timely manner. So when you're really looking at what is the problem we're trying to solve with cybersecurity? The problem with cybersecurity is we're not trying to prevent all attacks. That's impossible. We're not trying to stop all damage. What we're trying to do is get visibility for timely detection to control the overall damage. That's the problem that organizations continue to struggle with in cybersecurity. And that's one of the reasons we're having this conversation in this presentation, because at NetScout, you have a unique solution that can help organizations have proper visibility, get better timely detection to control the overall damage to an organization. That's the ultimate solution in cybersecurity that everyone is looking for. If they can get a better idea of what's happening on the network, if they can get better visibility and they can detect attacks much quicker, then do you realize the industry average today is two and a half years? Two and a half years organizations are compromised before they can detect the attack because they don't have the visibility they need. So I was over in Saudi Arabia a little before a year and a half ago, just before the epidemic started. And I was giving a keynote at one of their large international conventions. Now, if you've ever been to Saudi Arabia, the flights back to the United States are at 1 a.m. in the morning. So I decided to stick around and listen to some of the other presentations. So the next presentation after my keynote was a panel discussion. So the, the lead panelist gets up and says, okay, can each of the panelists introduce themselves? And I still remember as if it was yesterday, the first panelist gets up and introduces themselves and says, at our organization, we have had no attacks and no breaches for the last two years. And then they started going like this, like they were a hero and everyone's cheering, woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is a great thing. And I remember the next panelist gets up and proceeds to sort of be a little timid, sort of take a deep breath and look down and go, we've had three attacks in the last 12 months. And you almost heard quiet. And the person was like a little ashamed. And you almost some people like, boo, want to boo and, and do negative. And, and I'm sitting there and I got to be honest with you. I'm watching this whole thing happen. And it was the most galactically stupidest thing I have ever seen on the planet. The person who actually was naive enough to believe 
that they've had no attacks over the last two years, to me should be fired for gross negligence and has no right working in cybersecurity. And the person that detected three attacks in a timely manner over 12 months was a hero and should be promoted. But we still have this false misconception in cybersecurity that breaches are bad and compromises are not something that should be tolerated. And to me, that's totally backwards. You need to recognize that organizations of any size, from small, medium, large, to international organizations, are getting attacked on a regular basis. If you're not seeing the attack, it's not because you have magical unicorn-grade security. It's because you're not looking in the right places. So to me, this is one of the big education standpoints where organizations need to recognize that if you haven't detected an attack in the last 12, 18, 24 months, it's happening and you're just not looking in the right spot. And the reason is simple. Most organization security is set up to detect visible attacks. Remember in the mid to late 90s, when cybersecurity really started to get its traction with some of the major attacks like the I love you virus, Melissa, and several of the others. In all of those cases, something visible happened on the network. Unless you work for a really screwed up organization, it is not normal for you to go into work in the morning and say, oh, you know something, before I start my day, I need to tell all my coworkers I love them. I, I, you know something, I haven't told the CEO today how much I love them. I, I need to do that. I, that's not normal. But I am a doctor, not a medical or psychologist, but I can tell you, if you're sending I love you messages to coworkers, you need some help, right? That is not normal activity. So clearly, we were able to detect the attack and take action. The problem today is today's attackers are stealthy. They're targeted. They're data focused. They're slipping under the radar. We're not seeing the activity. And we believe because there's nothing visible on our network that life is good when in reality, we're dealing with a silent killer. The adversary is there and breaking in and compromising an organization. And if you have not detected it in 12, 18, or 24 months, there's one simple reason. Your tools are not giving you the visibility or your team is not trained to understand how the adversary works. Really good world-class security organizations are detecting attacks on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And any organization that has not detected attacks in that frequency, all it means is they're being attacked and it's being ignored. And they're the organizations that are going to have major breaches to their environment. So in this presentation, I've already started talking about the changing threat landscape. Want to make sure you recognize that every organization, no matter how small or how big is a target, how attackers happen, what's happening in the future, how to control damage, and most importantly, why the market needs a solution like Netscout. We have to recognize that in any practical sense, 100% security doesn't exist. If you have functionality, you will not be 100% secure. And I remember when I give presentations, I have some set slides that I use, but just like I'm doing for you, I customize it for every single audience. So this was about three years ago. I was down in Orlando, Florida, giving a Gartner presentation in front of about 4,000 people. And one of the slides that I presented on hundreds of times popped up. But today, on that given day, I did something different. Normally, I just look at the slide and say 100% security doesn't exist, and I move on. But on this particular occasion, I look back at the slide, and I look back at the audience, and I said, is that really true? Is it true that we can't achieve 100% security? So I held up my cell phone and I said, can we make this 100% secure? And somebody in the audience yelled out, turn it off. So I said, great. Somebody said, but you can turn it back on. So somebody else yelled, smash it to pieces with a hammer. So I said, okay, if we turn it off and smash it to pieces with a hammer, have we achieved 100% security? And I kid you not, there was a person in the third row. He goes, but you could glue it back together. I'm like, really? We're really going there? Come on. Right? So I said, okay, what do we need to do? 
And he said, you need to pour lighter fluid on it and light it on fire. And he almost did it a little too, a little too exciting. It was a little, it was actually a little creepy. So at these larger events, I, I usually have security. So I'm like, make sure you keep that guy away from me, right? He's a little weird, right? Get, get a little too excited about fire. So I said, okay, okay. So if we go in and we take our phone, we turn it off, we smash it to pieces and we burn it to a crisp. Can we all now agree that we've achieved 100% security? Yes. So at some theoretical level, we can achieve 100% security. But here's the problem. With that cell phone being smashed to pieces and burned to a crisp, what value does it have to me? Zero, right? No value, no functionality. So in reality, the only way to achieve 100% security is to have zero functionality and zero value to any organization, which now brings us to one of the core laws of security. This is just like the law of gravity. The law of gravity is always in play, no matter what, and the law of security is always in play. And the law of security is this. Whenever you add functionality to a system, you are decreasing the overall security. It's a law. It's a guarantee. Whenever there's new functionality being added, it's always going to decrease security. Here's the problem in most organizations. They ignore the second part. And many organizations, when they make decisions, they're saying, what is the value or benefit? And if there's value or benefit, they do it but they never ask the second question. And the second question that every executive, every business leader, every person who's doing any work for any organization, family, or personal life has to always ask the second question. The first question when making a decision, what is the value and benefit? The second question is what is the risk of exposure? Cause it will always be there. And then you do a simple analysis. Is the risk worth the value? Is the value and benefit you're getting worth the risk and exposure. If it is, do it. If not, don't. And that's all cybersecurity really is, asking the proper questions. People always come up to me and go, Eric, I bet you you're going to tell me that a lecture is not secure. Or I bet you're going to tell me I shouldn't do X, I shouldn't do Y. Never. All I'm going to do is ask you, what is the value and benefit you get from putting an Alexa in your house? Then what is the risk and exposure? And is that benefit worth the risk and exposure? And to prove to you that people don't do this, when Alexa first came out, everyone bought one because the functionality was so cool. Right? We could go in and say, what's the weather? Or turn on some music. Really, you can't do that yourself? Right? But people thought that was so cool, so they bought the functionality. And then a couple of years later, they started saying, wait a second. Alexa is recording everything we're saying. It is basically having a wiretap in your home. And I always love this. People always go, oh, no, Eric. Alexa is not listening or recording. Think about it. If it's not listening, how can it respond? Right? How in the world can it respond if it's not listening 24 seven and then like, oh, the light goes on. And then once people realized that Alexa was listening and recording to your entire conversation, what did everyone do? They started ripping Alexas out of their house because they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We thought this functionality and benefit was free and we don't like all these security risks that are associated with it. So it's very important and when you're looking at security in any aspect, whether it's for your organization, your clients, or your personal life, always go in and say, what is the value and benefit? What is the risk and exposure? And is that value and benefit worth that risk and exposure? Because whether you like it or not, when you're adding functionality, you are always decreasing security. And the organizations that are winning are the ones that are identifying the security and saying, is that an appropriate level of risk? And organizations that are ignoring, and only looking at functionality are the ones that offer suffer the consequences and have a major breach. So now when we're looking at this thing called risk, risk is the probability of loss. Risk is the probability of something bad happening in the future. We don't know what's going to happen. But what we need to do is always look at the two components of risk, threat times vulnerability. Threat is the potential for harm to an organization. Vulnerability are weaknesses that allows a threat to manifest itself in a timely manner. Now, here's the problem. Most organizations look at that formula and say, okay, if risk equals threat times vulnerability, because they're multiplied together, I have to fix one of those. If I address either threat or vulnerability because they're multiplied, I can reduce the risk. 
Now, which of those two do you control? Vulnerabilities. You don't control threats. You don't control ransomware. You don't control foreign adversaries. You can control whether systems are exposed, whether systems are not patched, or other vulnerabilities in your organization. So most people just jump in and start fixing random vulnerabilities. I hear things like five vulnerabilities a day keeps the attackers away, or fix the low-hanging fruit because then you're making progress. The reality is this. If you don't understand what the threats are that have the highest likelihood, you could be fixing vulnerabilities that are completely benign. If there's a vulnerability with no threat, who cares? So what we need to start doing is saying, what are the threats that have the highest likelihood? And what are the vulnerabilities that would allow those threats to have the biggest impact to the organization and start focusing in on those specific areas? And let me help you out. The biggest vulnerability in almost every client and organization that we work with is lack of visibility of attack vectors. They're not catching the attacker when they break in. Yes, patching is important, but guess what? Even if you patch a server, an adversary can still break in. Configuration management is really important, but even with configuration management, they can still break in. The biggest vulnerability in most organizations is once somebody breaks in, they're not catching them and responding and reacting in a timely manner. Why aren't we going in and looking for lateral movement? Why aren't we going in and detecting pivot points within an organization? Why aren't we going in and looking at outbound command to control channels to catch the adversary? Which, by the way, is not difficult to do if you're actually looking in the right area and looking at the right information or the right data. So as we mentioned, the difference between a major breach and a minor breach is not the server that's broken into. It's the amount of data that's compromised, which is in direct correlation to timely detection. Just think about a large hotel chain that had 500 million records compromised. Why did they have 500 million records compromised? Because there was a server on the network they didn't know about that contained critical client data that was not properly encrypted, and they didn't detect it for two and a half years. The two and a half years is the reason why they had 500 million records. It wasn't because they were unpatched. It wasn't because it contained critical data, which by the way, you shouldn't do. Right? Prevention is ideal. You should try to prevent attacks. So patching servers, good. Internet-facing systems not containing critical data, good. Critical data properly encrypted, good. Right? Those are things that organizations should be doing. But regardless of whether they were or were not patched or did not or did or did not contain critical data, had nothing to do with the 500 million records. They could have been unpatched, contained critical data, and if they detected the attack in 10 minutes, there might have been five records stolen. And nobody would have knew about it because it was a minor breach. So the name of the game is how can we get better visibility into behavioral analytics on the network to look for anomalies to detect attacks in a timely manner? Solutions that can do timely detection to control the damage are the ones that are going to win and dominate the space in cybersecurity. So all of these issues and challenges we're talking about in terms of not detecting attack and organizations being compromised has always been a problem. This was a major issue even to, in 2019. However, with the epidemic and the changing threat landscape in 2020, it has actually taken this problem and increased it X Exponentially. Let's just go ahead and look at a few of these key areas. First, one of my favorite questions that I like to ask organizations is how many new offices did you open in 2020? And about two months ago, I was up in New York City meeting with the CIO of a large billion dollar financial firm. And I asked him that simple question How many new offices did you open in 2020? And he looked a little confused and was like, Eric, we didn't open up any new offices. We actually closed down three of our major offices. So we actually shut down offices. We didn't open up any new offices. I said, okay. In 2020, how many people are now working from home that previously were not working from home? And he looked up the number and he told me 33,000. So I looked at him, I said, so what you're telling me is in 2020, you opened up 33,000 new offices. And it was funny, I was like, wait for it, wait for it. He was like, 
Uh, right? He never thought of it from that perspective. And then he got really concerned because he goes, Eric, normally when we open up an office, there's a lot of embedded security. We have a lot of security devices and a lot of protection and a lot of controls in place that everyone in the office sits behind and is protected and attacks are minimized. He goes, but now literally overnight, we let people open up 33,000 home offices and the wireless was typically set up by your kids, which don't get me wrong, kids are brilliant, right? My kids know more about tech than I do. The problem is kids are more concerned about TikTok videos and can they play Fortnite over cybersecurity, right? So you'll have great functionality right, at your home, but the security might be questionable. And then many people are now using outdated personal operating systems that are probably not patched up to date or secured. So we've now taken a pretty big target rich vector and increased it significantly for now all these home offices. Then when you're in the office, most of our clients are behind significant number of security to protect and secure their email and web surfing and attacks. Now at home, they're directly connected to the internet. So now we've gone in and greatly increased the threats, the exposures and the vectors. And the two biggest attacks we still see are phishing attacks and direct attacks against servers. Now, starting with server-based attacks, the common way servers are compromised today is very simple. You have a system visible from the internet, it's missing patches, it contains critical data that's not properly encrypted. So as simple as this sounds, if you wanna stop today's current attacks against servers, it's quite simple. Patch all of your internet facing systems and internet facing systems never contain critical data. Well, that's all well and good, but now with COVID and the epidemic, many organizations have to have systems visible from the internet and many organizations are rapidly moving to the cloud. So now all of your data information and applications are directly accessible with the cloud. So once again, one of the key models of cybersecurity, if you want to win at this game, is prevention is ideal, detection is a must. Preventing attacks is important, but getting visibility into what the adversary is doing. When an adversary breaks into a server, they're going to create what's called a pivot point. And they're often going to go in and be able to survive a reboot and make changes to the system. That's detectable. They're then going to go in and start to move deeper and deeper into the network to get to critical data. That's called lateral movement, and that's detectable. Then once they compromise a critical server, they're then going to go in and make an outbound command and control channel to exfiltrate the data out of the organization. That's also detectable. So the way we need to think about cybersecurity is instead of going in and trying to prevent, 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 which is fool's gold, it's not going to happen. Now, prevention is still good, but you shouldn't rest on it. We need to put a lot more energy and effort on visibility and detection. How can I get better visibility? So instead of the adversary blending in, they now can stick out and be very easy to detect. Great example. We have many of our clients are getting hit with financial crimes where they are going in and extracting critical data out of the organization and selling it on the dark web. Here's the interesting thing. When we went in and did a geolocation map of all the outbound connections, these companies only do business within the United States. They're in the United States, their clients are in the United States, all their employees are in the United States. Yet when we did this heat map, we saw connections going to foreign countries, right? And, and pick your direction, east or west, it doesn't matter, right? They're going in both. And I remember when I showed this chart to a CEO, I said, you asked me if you're secure. Here's a map of the world. Here's your headquarters. Here's where all of your data is going. This is a non-technical CEO. And he quickly said, why in the world? Well, he put a few adjectives in front of that, but I'll leave that out to keep this presentation PG-13, right? He said, bleep, 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 bleep. Do we have connections going to bleep, bleep, bleep countries, right? And the point is, once I knew where to look and provide the proper visibility, detecting attacks are easy. It's just most organizations are not looking in the right spot. And that's the problem. It's not that this is difficult. You just need tools that can shine the light 
provide the visibility, show the anomalies in what's happening in the network. So organizations can then use that data to make the proper decisions to contain, control the damage and detect attacks within a timely manner. Now, client attacks are typically done via phishing. And once again, once somebody is phished, they set up a pivot point and everything else is the same. They set up a pivot point, they do lateral movement, and they make an outbound command to control channel. So the interesting part is, regardless of whether they're entering via a server or a client, the damage to the organization happens when you have lateral movement within the organization and when you have outbound command to control channels to exfiltrate data. So if I had to sort of summarize a world-class solution for dealing with attacks, whether it's against servers or clients, it would be a solution that can catch anomalous traffic moving within an organization and anything that looks at outbound traffic to look for any anomalies, impacts, or anything related to performance within the environment. So just sort of summarizing all of this together, when we're looking at core characteristics of an attack, some phishing attacks are just opportunities where they're just going to go in and send out an email to 100,000 people and see if anybody clicks on it. The one we're seeing all the time that has about a 60% success rate, which is super high, most phishing attempts are about a 10%, but this one is 60. You get an email that says coworkers or students uh, of your ch child uh, in school. So students that go to school with your children or coworkers infected with COVID. And then the body of the email says, several of your coworkers tested positive for COVID. Click this link to go in and see who they were. And even after awareness training, even after we tell people don't do it, they still go in and click on that link. So that's gonna always happen. Most of those are trying to take over email so they can send the basic attacks. Can you please transfer 10,000 or $100,000? They're, they're attacks, but they're some of the more basic style of attacks. When you're talking any level of sophistication where they're targeting an organization, trying to steal critical data and cause direct harm, there's always going to be internal reconnaissance. There's always going to be reconnaissance against the organization. It is visible, it is obvious. If you know what to look for, it is easy to detect, but most of the tools out on the market aren't configured or set up to deal with or detect reconnaissance. So reconnaissance is one of that key areas where tools like NetScout can actually go in and come back and say, this is not normal traffic. This is not something that should be happening against your systems. And then the best part is with reconnaissance, it's before the attack. That is ideal. If you can detect attacks before they actually happen, that is when you start winning this game. Then they're gonna target an individual or a system. They're gonna deliver payload. They're gonna upload files, run process a survivor reboot, make outbound connections, perform internal reconnaissance, and pivot into the network. Now, here's the cool part. Even though every attack is unique and different, this is why signature detection no longer works. Like that went out of style a long time ago because every attack is unique in how it works. What I realized is the core characteristics are always the same. The actual attack might be different, but all advanced level attacks are going to do reconnaissance, deliver payloads, upload files, run processes, survive reboots, do lateral movement, set up a pivot point, and do outbound command and control channels. So if you're focused in on these core areas, well, here's the cool part. Pick two or three. You don't have to do all of them. So if you're doing reconnaissance, you're catching the attack beforehand. If you're doing performance monitoring, you're catching the attack right after it happened. And if you're monitoring outbound connections, you're now catching the attack as soon as the damage component occurs. And if you're doing those three things, almost all of your attacks are going to be minor because you have visibility and insight and know what's happening and what's occurring in your environment. Now, let me let you in on a little secret, a secret that none of your competitors want anybody to know. And the secret is this. Even companies that are purchasing five, 10, and $15 million of your competitors' products, those products are not actually the reason organizations caught the attack. 
in almost every situation, the reason why the organization caught the attack is because of performance issues. A server that was running at 60% utilization of memory or CPU for multiple years, all of a sudden is now spiking at 100%. Your network performance that was at 40% is now at 95%. And all of a sudden, IT are getting alerts. They're going in and saying, what's happening? What's occurring? And they're realizing that the system is compromised. Here's the problem. Attackers do what we call a low and slow technique. So they're going to break into a system that's at 30% utilization. And they're going to start stealing data. And after four or five months, they're going to increase the utilization to 40 or 50%. Then after another 12 to 18 months, they're going to increase it to 60 or 70%. And then after 18 to 24 months, they're going to increase it to 80 or 90%. And then after about two or three years, they, go, they keep getting greedy and want more and more. It goes to 100, and that's when the IT department detects it. But what if you could go in and detect it when it goes from 40 to 50? You're now catching an attack within three to six months. So that's really the trick here is attackers can bypass most of the security devices on the network, but if they're causing things to happen on a server, which they always do, they can't get around the performance issues. They can't get around those changes in performance. So if you're properly managing or watching the performance, you can now detect attacks in a very quick, timely manner. Now, just to drive this home, if you read a lot of these articles, after a major breach, your competitors will say, oh, we detected the attack. We detected the attack. Here's the problem. Yes, they detected the attack along with thousands of false positives. So one of these tools that I won't mention their names, but they always brag that they're catching attacks and the company just didn't listen to them. They're generating between six to 8,000 alerts a day where two or three of them are real sophisticated attacks. Well, what's the problem in most companies? They have enough staff to handle three or 400 alerts. So if your team can only handle three or 400 alerts and that tool is generating six to 8,000, what is the probability you're going to catch the real attack? Almost zero. And that's the problem today. The attacks have way too much noise that they're not providing valuable insight or information to the organization. And it's evident. We've done these studies where we looked at what security measures were in place during a breach. Almost all of our clients, with a few exceptions, had compliance, they had firewalls, they had IDSs, they had endpoint security, they had antivirus, and they still got compromised because there's too many alerts and not enough resources. The false positives are way too high. And this is the big one. They're focused way too much on prevention. They're all about inbound prevention. And if you want the secret, the detection they have in place is still focused on inbound traffic. Inbound traffic is way too noisy. There's way too much going on. If you want to win at this game called cybersecurity, inbound prevention and outbound detection, you need to put your energy and effort at looking at what's leaving the organization and going in and detecting anomalies in terms of connection, size, performance, and location and where they're going. And if you just focus in on those core areas, all of a sudden, you can start to detect the attack in a timely manner.